Lesson 8 Ministering Like Jesus Sabbath Afternoon August 15 When Christ saw the multitudes that gathered about him, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Christ saw the sickness, the sorrow, the want and degradation of the multitudes that thronged his steps. To him were presented the needs and woes of humanity throughout the world. Among the high and the low, the most honored and the most degraded, he beheld souls who were longing for the very blessings he had come to bring souls who needed only a knowledge of his grace to become subjects of his kingdom. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Matthew chapter 9, verses 36 to 38. Today the same need exists. The world is in need of workers who will labor as Christ did for the suffering and the sinful. There is indeed a multitude to be reached. The world is full of sickness, suffering, distress, and sin. It is full of those who need to be ministered unto, the weak, the helpless, the ignorant, the degraded. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 254. That God who sent the ravens to feed Elijah by the brook Cherith will not pass by one of his faithful self-sacrificing children. Of him that walketh righteously it is written, Bread shall be given him, his waters shall be sure. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He who lightened the cares and anxieties of his widowed mother and helped to provide for the household of Nazareth sympathizes with every mother in her struggle to provide her children food. He who had compassion on the multitude because they fainted and were scattered abroad still has compassion on the suffering poor. His hand is stretched out toward them in blessing and in the very prayer which he gave his disciples, he teaches us to remember the poor. Lift him up. Page 131. The truth as it is in Jesus can be experienced, but never explained. Its height and breadth and depth pass our knowledge. We may task our imagination to the utmost, and then we shall see only dimly the outlines of a love that is unexplainable, that is as high as heaven, but that stooped to the earth to stamp the image of God on all mankind. Yet it is possible for us to see all that we can bear of the divine compassion. This is unfolded to the humble, contrite soul. We shall understand God's compassion just in proportion as we appreciate His sacrifice for us. As we search the Word of God in humility of heart, the grand theme of redemption will open to our research. It will increase in brightness as we behold it, and as we aspire to grasp it, its height and depth will ever increase. Christ's Object Lessons, page 129. Sunday, August 16. Jesus' Attitude Toward People At his coming, the Jews did not receive him because they had gathered a false idea as to the manner of his coming. This Jesus, a peasant and a carpenter of obscure origin, the Son of God, the Messiah? It could not be. But the peculiarity separating the Jews from other nations disappeared in Christ. He placed himself where he could give instruction to all classes of people. Often he told them that he was related to the whole human family, Jew and Gentile. I am not come to call the self-righteous, but sinners to repentance, he declared. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. For this he left the ninety and nine. For this he laid off his royal robes and veiled his divinity with humanity. The whole world is Christ's field of labor. A sphere narrower than this does not enter his thoughts. Lift him up, page 35. Angels are watching the development of character and weighing moral worth. 
those who profess to believe the truth should be right themselves and exert all their influence to enlighten and win others to the truth. Their words and works are the channel through which the pure principles of truth and holiness are conveyed to the world. They are the salt of the earth and the light thereof. I saw that in looking heavenward we shall see light and peace, but in looking to the world we shall see that every refuge must soon fail us and every good soon pass away. There is no help for us but in God. In this state of earth's confusion, we can be composed, strong, or safe only in the strength of living faith. Nor can we be at peace only as we rest in God and wait for His salvation. Greater light shines upon us than shone upon our fathers. We cannot be accepted or honored of God in rendering the same service or doing the same works that our fathers did. In order to be accepted and blessed of God, as they were, we must imitate their faithfulness and zeal, improve our light as they improved theirs, and do as they would have done had they lived in our day. We must walk in the light which shines upon us, otherwise that light will become darkness. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 262. There are two kingdoms in this world, the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of Satan. To one of these kingdoms, each one of us belongs. It is not God's will that we should seclude ourselves from the world, but while in the world, we should sanctify ourselves to God. We should not pattern after the world. We are to be in the world as a corrective influence, as salt that retains its savor. Among an unholy, impure, idolatrous generation, we are to be pure and holy, showing that the grace of Christ has power to restore in man the divine likeness. We are to exert a saving influence upon the world. Councils on Health, page 592. Monday, August 17. Jesus' Treatment of People Notwithstanding the formalism of the Jews, this Roman, centurion, was convinced that their religion was superior to his own. Already he had broken through the barriers of national prejudice and hatred that separated the conquerors from the conquered people. He had manifested respect for the service of God and had shown kindness to the Jews as his worshipers. In the teaching of Christ, as it had been reported to him, he found that which met the need of the soul. All that was spiritual within him responded to the Savior's words. He said to Jesus, As I represent the power of Rome, and my soldiers recognize my authority as supreme, so dost thou represent the power of the infinite God, and all created things obey thy word. Thou canst command the disease to depart, and it shall obey thee. Thou canst summon thy heavenly messengers, and they shall impart healing virtue. Speak but the word and my servant shall be healed. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. The Desire of Ages, pages 315 and 316. The scribe who had questioned Jesus was well read in the law, and he was astonished at his words. He did not expect him to manifest so deep and thorough a knowledge of the scriptures. He had gained a broader view of the principles underlying the sacred precepts. Before the assembled priests and rulers, he honestly acknowledged that Christ had given the right interpretation to the law, saying, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he, and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself, is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. The wisdom of Christ's answer had convicted the scribe. He knew that the Jewish religion consisted in outward ceremonies rather than inward piety. He had some sense of the worthlessness of mere ceremonial offerings and the faithless shedding of blood for expiation of sin. Love and obedience to God and unselfish regard for man appeared to him of more value than all these rites. 
the readiness of this man to acknowledge the correctness of Christ's reasoning and his decided and prompt response before the people manifested a spirit entirely different from that of the priests and rulers. The heart of Jesus went out in pity to the honest scribe who had dared to face the frowns of the priests and the threats of the rulers to speak the convictions of his heart. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. The Desire of Ages, pages 607 and 608. Tuesday, August 18. Jesus' Healing Ministry, Part 1. The words falling from the lips of Jesus, Thy sins be forgiven thee, Matthew chapter 9, verse 2, are worth everything to us. He saith, I have borne your sins in my own body on Calvary's cross. He sees your sorrows. His hand is laid upon the head of every contrite soul, and Jesus becomes our advocate before the Father and our Savior. The lowly, contrite heart will make very much of forgiveness and pardon. We may repeat His tender compassion for us to others who are wandering in the mazes of sin. The grace of Christ revealed to us must be tenderly revealed to others. A great tenderness and compassion will fill the soul for human beings who are still under the control of Satan. Christ is to be multiplied in every man and woman who believes in Him, for they are to live over the life of Christ in blessing and enlightening and bringing hope and peace and joy to other hearts. That I May Know Him, page 235. You have confessed your sins and in heart put them away. You have resolved to give yourself to God. Now go to Him and ask that He will wash away your sins and give you a new heart. Then believe that He does this because He has promised. This is the lesson which Jesus taught while He was on earth, that the gift which God promises us we must believe we do receive, and it is ours. Jesus healed the people of their diseases when they had faith in His power. He helped them in the things which they could see, thus inspiring them with confidence in Him concerning things which they could not see, leading them to believe in His power to forgive sins. This He plainly stated in the healing of the man sick with palsy, that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith He to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. Matthew chapter 9, verse 6. Steps to Christ, pages 49 and 50. Christ in his life on earth taught the lesson of careful attention to the little things. The great work of redemption weighed continually upon his soul. As he was teaching and healing, all the energies of mind and body were taxed to the utmost, Yet he noticed the most simple things in life and in nature. His most instructive lessons were those in which, by the simple things of nature, he illustrated the great truths of the kingdom of God. He did not overlook the necessities of the humblest of his servants. His ear heard every cry of need. He was awake to the touch of the afflicted woman in the crowd. The very slightest touch of faith brought a response. When he raised from the dead the daughter of Jairus, he reminded her parents that she must have something to eat. Christ's Object Lessons, page 357 Wednesday, August 19 Jesus' Healing Ministry, Part 2 Christ came to heal the sick, to proclaim deliverance to the captives of Satan. He was in himself health and strength. He imparted his life to the sick, the afflicted, those possessed of demons. He turned away none who came to receive his healing power. He knew that those who petitioned him for help had brought disease upon themselves, yet he did not refuse to heal them. And when virtue from Christ entered into these poor souls, they were convicted of sin, and many were healed of their spiritual disease as well as of their physical maladies. The gospel still possesses the same power, and why should we not today witness the same results? Christ feels the woes of every sufferer. 
When evil spirits rend a human frame, Christ feels the curse. When fever is burning up the life current, he feels the agony, and he is just as willing to heal the sick now as when he was personally on earth. Christ's servants are his representatives, the channels for his working. He desires through them to exercise his healing power. Lift him up, page 258. Early in the morning, Peter and his companions came to Jesus, saying that already the people of Capernaum were seeking him. With surprise, they heard Christ's words, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. Luke chapter 4, verse 43. In the excitement which then pervaded Capernaum, there was danger that the object of his mission would be lost sight of. Jesus was not satisfied to attract attention to himself merely as a wonder worker or as a healer of physical disease. He was seeking to draw men to him as their savior. While the people were eager to believe that he had come as a king to establish an earthly reign, he desired to turn their minds from the earthly to the spiritual. Mere worldly success would interfere with his work. And the wonder of the careless crowd jarred upon his spirits. No self-assertion mingled with his life. The homage which the world gives to position, wealth, or talent was foreign to the Son of Man. None of the means that men employ to win allegiance or command homage did Jesus use. Centuries before his birth, it had been prophesied of him, He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the dimly burning flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. Isaiah chapter 42, verses 2 and 3, margin. The Ministry of Healing, pages 30 and 31. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. In him was life, and he says, I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. He is a quickening spirit. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, John chapter 1, verse 4, and chapter 10, verse 10, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. And he still has the same life-giving power as when on earth he healed the sick and spoke forgiveness to the sinner. He forgiveth all thine iniquities. He healeth all thy diseases. Psalm 103, verse 3. The Desire of Ages, page 270. Thursday, August 20. What Matters to Jesus Those who will receive the most abundant reward will be those who have mingled with their activity and zeal gracious tender pity for the poor, the orphan, the oppressed, and the afflicted. But those who pass by on the other side, who are too busy to give attention to the purchase of the blood of Christ, who are full of doing the great things, will find themselves least and last. Men act out the true character of the heart. There are about us those who have a meek and lowly spirit, the Spirit of Christ, who do many little things to help those around them, and who think nothing of it. They will be astonished at last to find that Christ has noticed the kind word spoken to the disheartened and taken account of the smallest gift given for the relief of the poor that costs the giver some self-denial. The Lord measures the spirit and rewards accordingly, and the pure, humble, childlike spirit of love makes the offering precious in His sight. Councils on Stewardship, page 340. In placing among them the helpless and the poor to be dependent upon their care, Christ tests his professed followers. By our love and service for his needy children, we prove the genuineness of our love for him. To neglect them is to declare ourselves false disciples, strangers to Christ and his love. If all were done that could be done in providing homes and families for orphan children, there would still remain very many requiring care. Many of them have received an inheritance of evil. They are unpromising, unattractive, perverse, but they are the purchase of the blood of Christ and in His sight are just as precious as our own little ones. Unless a helping hand is held out to them, they will grow up in ignorance and drift into vice and crime. Many of these children could be rescued, 
through the work of orphan asylums. The Ministry of Healing, page 205. All heaven will be emptied of the angels, while the waiting saints will be looking for him and gazing into heaven as were the men of Galilee when he ascended from the Mount of Olivet. Then only those who are holy, those who have followed fully the meek pattern, will with rapturous joy exclaim as they behold him, Lo, this is our God, we have waited for him, and he will save us. And they will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, that trump which wakes the sleeping saints and calls them forth from their dusty beds, clothed with glorious immortality and shouting, Victory! Victory over death and the grave! Maranatha, page 291. For further reading, Testimonies for the Church, The Health Institute, Volume 1, page 637, and Lift Him Up, The Crown of Life, page 343.